Welcome to Biggest Geekus. We're your hosts. I'm Randy. And I'm Joe. This is episode 46 of our podcast, and the date is Friday, July 16th, 2021. Friday, Friday, that Friday. Yeah, that's two days from the last one, but again, we're doing a little advanced recording because things happen in this summer. It's summer. That's yeah. fine. We already have some messages, so that'll work out. Dang, that's sweet. Let's hop, hop right into that. Let's hear the call-ins and messages. Hopping into the calls. All right. What kind of goodness we got here. Hey guys, Jason here. I'm calling before the negative plane segment of your Hattie Roland D&D Styles. Uh, episode 45. That's it. Hey, I can read. So, um, the, of course, I don't get to run long campaigns. I get to run shorter, you know, four to six session arcs usually. I would love to do episodic where we make characters and then just revisit them now and then and do different adventures with those same characters um, as opposed to running one shots. But typically, Carl wants to jam all the time, so I don't get jammed. That's not fair to Carl. <laughs> but... Yeah, I, I don't I just don't get to run a long game, so I don't get to mess those things that you're messing with there, unfortunately. But, you know, someday I'll retire and I'll have time to, to do that. But great great discussion on the different play styles and the pros and cons. I wish we got to run long campaigns. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> We're trying. Trying to make it happen. I think sometimes <clears throat> continuity makes us quit so if somebody drops out the feeling is games it's over. not the, yeah game's over when it may not need to be unless it's the dm <laughs> if the dm well, drops out then you yeah can't i think that's a fun that might be a topic what makes campaigns fizzle out yeah yeah as far as mud sword goes i look forward to hearing the progression of it um I think instead of critiquing what you're doing, because obviously that's kind of silly, is you're slowly going through ideas and developing things. I, I'm going to come up with my own project and slowly do my OD&D, you know, my OSR Heartbreaker, which is funny since I don't run OSR games. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think I'll critique your guys too much. What, what are you doing with initiative? So the, the one concern I would have with when you're doing the discussion on slow weapons and crossbows and all that is if you're not careful, you're going to make, make it. So people are always going to pick the most effective weapon, right? Whatever weapon has the most, whatever weapon has the best numbers is the weapon everybody's going to pick. Yeah. I'm not. And I know we had a short discussion before and I said, everybody should have a, have their aesthetic weapon choice validated. But I'm not sure if in the even and with that we shouldn't simulate the real world. But there are some choices that are better than others. Right. Which but, was go ahead. I mean, right now a gun is. For yes. for, for personal self defense, almost nothing beats a gun. That's the but that's the ivory tower approach that Monty Cook got excoriated on online for in third yeah. edition. Because there were some feats that were poor choices. Well, I, like toughness. <laughs> that was poor right. choice. That wasn't uh, merely not as good as something else. That was just a poor choice and probably a poorly designed feat because of it. But um, having some, some things that are better than others uh, isn't necessarily, I mean, I understand, and I was just suggesting everybody have their have their day in court, so to speak. I want to wield two daggers. You want to deal, deal uh, wield a, uh, a great sword. Uh, you shouldn't be penalized for an aesthetic choice like that. But I, and I get it. So why not do? Why not design that way? It's a, it's a design decision. So you well because yeah, we're, we're, we're in between two. Uh, I know you think that you always think there's a middle ground. There probably is between the 13th age approach where you say, okay, it's not the, it's not the weapon. It's the man, right. The dude wielding it. So like if you're playing 13th age, you can pretty much say I'm using, and if you, and you do whatever you want, they, you know, the two guys that designed it are, you know, either a little bit more permissive or less permissive, but in, in, in their 
very own words, I can say, well, you're a fourth level fighter, so you, de you do 4d8 damage no matter what you weapon you pick up. And that sounds good, but it also feels a little bland. And then there's the other end where every, we every weapon has a different amount of damage and they have the property of slow or parry or reach. And then you start saying, well, this is better for this. This is better for that. And, and you start having to make these decisions, uh, which comes in today's topic of resource management. I mean, then you're kind of managing when you need what. And then people complain about, I need a golf, ball golf bag approach to weapons. And it's usually in relation to magic, but it could be, I want a reach weapon. I want a range weapon. I want to up close, you know, fast weapon i want a slow weapon i mean <laughs> yeah i don't know there's probably a happy medium in there somewhere yeah and i'm not sure if we're going to get it we might just pick something and do it yeah and you know what it may just be old school weapons do the different dice damage right <laughs> course in the real world the advantage of the crossbow was it was a lot easier to train people on the same thing with the gun eventually right so longbow took a lot of effort a lot of training you know bows are harder to use than crossbows we see that today in archery and bow hunting and that's why crossbows are now legal you, you know used to be crossbows were only legal to hunt with for people with disabilities and um now crossbows are becoming the standard for hunting not the standard but they're much more prevalent in bow hunting um just because of the great ease and because people want bow hunting seasons to keep up, people in archery want to keep those bow hunting seasons up. So they've let the crossbow hunters in and haven't fought that because they want to keep the numbers up, number of hunters up. And, you know, it's kind of a self, you know, defeating thing, right? But these games don't simulate, don't give us that. Right. You, you can't, because what, what is, let's say ignoring the training factor between a crossbow and a regular longbow is a longbow superior in some way, say in accuracy or something like that range to the, to the crossbow and right. crossbows. You can engineer to have a uh, much higher penetration because they're going to have a higher uh, draw. Yeah. <clears throat> because you, you you mechanically load them in uh, instead yeah. of manually load them. So right. <clears throat> so I wonder if the bow is more accurate or not. It'd be interesting to find out. Yeah. But yeah, you can't. The only way you can simulate the training part, and I think he's getting ready to say that. So I'll just hit it. Hit the play. Yeah. Now some games. Once you got to my understanding, is you got to the second. Ed once you hit second edition, and we got we saw this in Unearthed Canon first edition, which I played. I haven't really played second edition much, but you know, really, there's not in most D and D games. There's not a negative to use weapons. You don't know you're, you're not proficient, in, or it's not a big hurdle. So, of course, you're going to pick the short bow or the long bow over the crossbow because there's no learning curve there. It's your character can use them both automatically, right? But I think. The big, you know, and and I don't know that you want to bog the system down with simulate with doing weapon proficiencies and giving big negatives for non-proficient weapons, but I, I think that's the only in, unless you do that, I, I don't see how you, you're going to be able to simulate the the choice of crossbow over bow that happened in the real world. Not that you have to, because it's a game, so you don't have to simulate the real world. Yeah, the question is too, Joe. I mean, I. I kind of agree, Jason. I, I would say that what if your intention, though, because I've thought about that. We used to have the proficiencies and you can make this, I don't want to say complex, but demanding system to be able to use certain weapons. Um, you got to have, have four proficiency slots in the crossbow to be able to use a property. You got to have two to be able to use a short bow. You got to have three to use a long bow or vice versa or whatever. But to me, I think... And when Joe and I were talking before we started the pod today was um, maybe we just want to make every option viable and have its own little goodie, its own little cool benefit that would be more, maybe we just want it to be more stylistically. I like the fact that my fighter can trip things with my cool, with my weapon. 
I like the fight that I the fact that my fighter can penetrate armor more easily with this crossbow. But it's not necessarily any more advantageous than saying the rate of fire of a short bow is faster. But how much the math do I mean the math is not hard. I, I could do the uh, expected damage output because in the end, is that not the real choice? How much damage am I doing? Right? How, what effect am I having on the enemy? That's right, right. <clears throat> so if you're getting less hits, you're getting less damage. If you're <clears throat> penalized, I don't know that um, having a proficiency penalty bogs down the game. Uh, it doesn't. I mean, I'm just saying it's one more hoop to jump. Well, proficiency, like if you take slots and you got to place so many proficiency points into each weapon. Sure, that's sure. But it's just doing a flat. More. You're proficient in these. You're not proficient in those. Those things you're not proficient in. Not even saying you have slots to spend. You just right. have all your proficient uh, weapons from uh, from jump. Yeah. <clears throat> so all you have to do is uh, apply a modifier to your roll. We could use the five E modifier disadvantage. Yeah. It's roughly minus four. So there you go. <clears throat> That works. And minus four was, I uh, believe, the old penalty, wasn't it? How often it was, yep. Minus Probably. four. Probably. So disadvantage would work. And I don't think that bogs anything down. You just, mm -hmm. no, doesn't really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the same as just, I mean, uh, did, was everybody able to wield everything in OD&D? &D? No. Oh, yeah. I think so. It's been a while. I don't know. I, I didn't look at it. I don't know. Not that, that old, the magic is you couldn't. Right. So, what did that mean? If he picked up a sword and you swung it, you just never hit anything? It was never explained. Or could you not work it? It just didn't go into the air. <laughs> that was, I think that was the. You just said, Won't you go. Hit. <laughs> can't swing sword. Looks very simple, but I can't. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Gandalf could do it. Why can't I? <laughs> so, yeah. But the same thing with two-handed sword. I think there probably should be some kind of negative to it. Um, although, once you're proficient with it, so maybe that negative, again, is, I mean, your negative is you can't use a shield, which, depending how effective you make shields and what you do with shields, could matter. Um, but, but again, we go back to this proficiency thing, right? But I don't know. Um, I, I'm curious. You, you don't really outline what... What, what are you guys using group initiative? Are you using individual initiative? Are you using something like 2E? I kind of like 2E's initiative. In 2E's initiative, it'd be easy enough to tack on a segment or two for that two-handed sword. So it wouldn't be make you go last at the end every time, but it would have something for the size and weight of the weapon. Um, I don't know. I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Well, currently initiative we've been uh we used we had one play test jason so currently we use group initiative and uh i'm i'm a little fond of that now for its speed but i'm not opposed to individual even a segment type system where you had to weapons added to your initiative that's not that could be very simplified even with a group initiative i mean you could say group goes on three but the great sword gives you plus one you go on four See what I'm saying? And you still group, can go first. Group with exceptions. Group with exceptions. You can do that. I mean, yeah, I think <clears throat> I think the initiative system is interesting. And, and we even debated a bit. Uh, remember, you and Jeff said something that depending on the type of initiative system you use, the slow property of the greatsword would have more or less, especially if it wasn't just you go last no matter what. Then it doesn't matter what system you use. Yeah, I think a little. Uh, all these things have, I guess, their advantages. I think... Uh, just if you differentiate a little bit and then here comes uh having a giant table of weapons and each weapons uh, uh got a slightly different initiative property uh would be annoying i think it would be better to have a if you're going to do something like that for us mm -hmm. for us yeah uh you would go by a class of weapon not yeah. uh great sword long sword bastard sword short sword rapier no, no. you have yeah. a class of weapon 
uh, one hand most likely size hands. or yep. yeah by hand yep. uh, would have an initiative property that's common to all of them yeah i think the um second edition took a stab at that with weapon groups uh mm -hmm. pathfinder took a stab at that with specialization with weapon groups so yeah things to think that's definitely some good stuff to think about right yeah, i'm not sure with the initiative i personally prefer individual but that's me um i do uh i think it's probably overall better i just i'm always looking i look for ways to I don't, initiative i don't want to and I, there's been so many there's been the simple one where you roll where you roll a d6 or a d10 and each group goes you know and then uh it does make combat when you do group initiative i think there is the potential to make combat super uh the advantage can swing quickly. If you go last in the first round and then go first in the second round, the group gets two sets of attacks against the bad guy. Right, whereas if, if that was done on a, in an individual basis, mm -hmm. then the impact would be smaller. You might have a couple of people uh, that ha that happens to instead of the whole group or well, nobody, can... or, if, or the monster might beat everybody. Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. As far as the spe the skills, I'm not going to really comment. I need to read 13th Age and see exactly how it works. You, you know, although I like D6, like, you know, the old Star Wars D6, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of DCs and coming up with those because, you know, it always feels to me arbitrary. Well, how hard is this going to be? Is it going to be a 15 or an 18 target number? You, you know, and that always feels kind of arbitrary to me. And, and as a GM, I don't like having to come up with those numbers. So, so I like to have other ways to do that. But I, I agree with you. If you just do the straight attribute check, it can be difficult be, because somebody with higher attributes is always going to pass. Um, so I don't know. I'm going to have to do, do a think on that. Well, Jason, to be to give 13th Age especially a little bit of a nod in that approach with DCs, 13th Age really, and I think 4E did it as well, they really codify the DCs as like, Easy is a six or higher, um, medium average is 11 or higher, and then hard is 16 or higher. And granted, those numbers are technically quote unquote arbitrary, but probably not because what they are is their DCC doesn't have tons of modifiers, level, background, and that's it, and ability. 13th age. 13, what did I say? Yeah, 13th D age. Yeah. Okay. And so the DC approach, I think I'm with you if it's truly arbitrary the, D, the the dm sets whatever they want but if you say this is easy uh, this is medium this is hard and 13th age seems to hardwire it within their games especially if you buy their modules everything is set and they say you can play around with it one or two but they don't suggest that you do and i don't think you need to in 13th days when i play it i don't think you need to mess with the dcs at all um i think you just decide as a game designer how difficult do i want skill checks to be and right now i'm not sure if joe and i are on the same page but i know that i want a character i don't care if he's 74th level as a wizard i don't want any automatic skill checks i mean me meaning that by that i mean there is nothing that wizard cannot know right there are some things that are routine and they yes know, but right <clears throat> there are some things that he does not automatically know like at you know, but even at eighth level, maybe he he sees creatures that exist on his world, you know, fairly common, displacer, beast, ogres, and he has to roll to make sure that he knows them because he's never encountered one. By the time he's 15th level, even if he's not encountered them, he spent time studying, he has tons of arcane books, and he's like, I know everything on this planet. And when he sees the weird thing, you'd be like, mm, that doesn't belong here. Or this is something that no one's ever seen before. I wonder why. It could be that, but it's going to be rare. You know, and if you're playing that 15th level mage and you see something as a DM, I said, this is not a rare thing. I mean, it's not rare in the sense that no one's ever seen it. So, yeah, your wizard can say, oh, I've heard of these things and I know them. I wouldn't even call for a role. You know, there's no rolling. If, 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 I, want the, if I want the wizard to know stuff, I'll say, yeah, you know it. And, you know, it does feel a little more loosey-goosey there, but... I don't want the third edition basis where you can have a skill check that's ridiculous at low level. And you got to, I mean, literally you could have a seventh level wizard that has over plus 20 to their arcane knowledge role. 
easily mm-hmm. in three, five or Pathfinder. Right. And, and that's not even being completely super cheesy. No. You know, and then what does he not know? I mean, that's just, that's ridiculous. And that's, and that's just the one skill I'm picking on. It could be lots of things. Sure. That, sure. I, Jason's right. It's, it's arbitrary. You got to decide how you want your game to quote unquote roll. <laughs> but honestly, arbitrary is the name of the game. Honestly, yeah. Because uh, while DCs, if you're on the fly saying, you know, 17 is a little too easy. I'm going to make it 18. Yep. Uh, really? You, you're. You, how can you calibrate your arbitrariness to that no, degree? It's kind of yeah, weird. And, and, and you can't expect it. And you know what? And that's not necessarily wrong, though. No. Just don't worry about it. That's what you did. That's what I did. That's what and I so, did. Well, I thought it should have been a 17. I thought, well, you know. I get it, Joe, but I mean, I'm not trying to be a dick, but I'm the DM, so I had to make a decision, you know, and, and I mean, and Joe would punch me in the face and we'd go on. Right, right. Because he rolled 17. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things in the game is that's arbitrary. Sure. So it just a matter, yeah. it's well, just a matter of what you want, where you want your arbitrariness to be at. I mean, if we want to get pedantic here, it's arbitrary from the beginning. How, yeah. Are, yeah. how am I designing my game? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is how well, I've decided. Since we can't truly simulate, we have to make um, decisions and assumptions, and all a lot of that's arbitrary. Yeah. Why why are we sure that a dagger is less effective than a great sword? It just looks it looks like it because the great sword's got a really long blade. Yeah. But it may may not be. Mm-hmm. As far as the spe- the skills, I'm not going to really comment. I need to read Thirteenth Age and see exactly how it oh, works. You played that, you, you know. Although I like D6, like you know. Yeah. And as far as spells go, I don't see a negative to spell points, and I don't see a negative to letting them have all the spells of their level. Uh, you know, provided giving them the option of having that. I think maybe. It's interesting having to travel and find new spells, but but I I, I like the idea that I'm having access to all their spells. Let's say that. Um, although I also like the idea, and maybe you're doing this, and maybe I missed it, but I also like the idea of letting them tap into their to drain their attributes, kind of like DCC do spell burn. I like the idea to be able to do that either to gain extra spell points to cast additional spells, or to power up spells. Um, so I would look at that, you know, maybe you could do a temporary, you know, loss of strength, you temporary, you could use strength for spell points and then you regain it up, you know, two points of strength a day or something, right? So, something along those lines. Something yeah, to think I, about. Yeah. Well, remember I did the, it never got used nor mentioned in the podcast, but didn't get used in the game. Remember I had that over channel ability mm-hmm. or that very same thing, Jason, it didn't get mentioned because we didn't use it. But if you ran out of spell points, you could drain your constitution to cast, to cast um, magic. And I was at the, I was at that point, I was open to the idea of draining down to zero would take you unconscious. Draining to negatives would kill you. But I, I even had written down that if someone drains all their constitutions to negative, they go negative to cast a spell and it's their one ba- big last hurrah because what's going to happen is they're going to die. Your wizard will be dead after he casts that spell. And that's thematically cool. Um, I'm kind of a little bit in love with the idea of over channel, but I don't know if it'll end up making it. Right. And the thing about spell points, um, I think that we've discovered, not discovered, but it seems to be a recurring problem yeah. is that you get to, you can and you can do it at first level, so not, maybe yeah. not that big of a deal. Right. Uh, is you can spend all your points on casting just your high level spells. Yep. And uh, it seems like you're you're going to be able to cast at the very least uh, one of your highest level spell in every encounter before you get a rest. You know, an overnight rest, which can yeah. be it might, it might seem a little powerful. It's just me. I, I've yet to see a spell point system. I know John Allen pointed us to one. I didn't study it very close, and it might mm-hmm. be the one. It might be the solution. No, I did look at it. It didn't seem like it was, but maybe that was either the wizard was too weak, couldn't cast anything, or he's way too good. Um, 
kind of like the scion from three five who i thought was ridiculous and um which i don't think how anybody argues he's not when you have 400 power points at 20th level and you can cast oh um, gosh what was seven, 17 17 points for a ninth level power yeah do the math that's a boatload of ninth level powers in a day 20 and, i think yeah 20. Right. yeah it's 20 sorry. yeah then some so uh but yeah i don't know where that sweet i i feel like at the table, and it was not, I wasn't a hard conclusion, but the people that were talking about magic, we kind of ended up with spell points. Sounds like a no win place. Seems well, like. it, if you uh, want powerful spellcasters, spell points are is your yeah, right. It's the way to go. Yeah. Or if you want weak spellcasters, you can do spell points too. Yeah, you have one. Yeah, here you get one. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think I would lean toward that. You're up to, oh, yeah. Up to oh yeah, yeah. I am glad the calls in the negative material plane turned out not to be all that negative. They were pretty positive overall and pretty level-headed, except for that Jason guy. So <laughs> good job there. And last but not least, get a haircut, you darn hippie. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, knowing he doesn't watch the YouTube video, he can't know that I have a hair. I have long hair, especially right. uh, long for me, not right. long in the general. Jason can sense it as a holy man, though. But but I did mention I needed a haircut. <laughs> All right, and we have a final one here from oh. Tim. From Tim, oh, sweet. Seriously, guys, an X crawl telethon. This has got Cabin Con written all over it. Sign me up. I'll DM. I'll play whatever. Multiple DMs. We need to make this a thing. I'm sure Josh would be on board. Seriously. I mean, the, the Cabin Crawl Telethon to help out Joseph's kids. It would be amazing. We need to do this. It's, oh. it's, it's Jerry's kids, but no, it's yes. going to be Joseph's kids. That's ah. exactly, yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely right, dude. Telethon to help Joseph's kid. I'm going to create a. Um, uh, I got five kids. I'm trying to feed a divine or heavenly type figure named Father Joseph, mm -hmm. who, is, who is well thought of in the X crawl world, and he puts on this. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good it is good joe it was awesome yeah thanks tim good point dude yeah that'd be so fun that's thank all you to call all the callers there. yes awesome. thank you yeah yeah so uh we're gonna slip more into the positive material plane that was some good ones um we've only been a couple of days so not much uh game positive stuff to talk about except i do think this mentioned this other cup i know that venger satanus on our uh Little Facebook group there, conservative RPG Facebook group. He's talking about starting a VengerCon. So, well, yeah. you know, um, it doesn't really do any good to whine. Yes. You might as well do something. Or whinge like we do. Yeah. Do something. I mean, we have our own thing that we do. Yeah. And we're trying to make our own game. So we're not, we're not merely complaining about, uh, the state of the hobby, which, uh, -oh. uh some people will say the hobby's been taken from us, which it has not, because oh, I can dude. my books work and my dice work. So no, dude, and I can go. I could even go buy the books of the companies I don't like the direction they're going and take a marker and just mark out the stuff I don't want to have in my game. Right, right. I mean, I can do that. Yeah. They're not taking nothing. In fact, no. they can say I'm taking it from them. Right. <laughs> so, but uh, um, having a another. Uh, another convention even if it's not competitive with the other ones that doesn't matter if you have somewhere to go and and, and interact with uh like-minded hobbyists that's good enough i'm gonna really it's gonna be hard next year i know joe said it's tough for him with his situation at work summertime's busy and the mail the mail well, man it's it's like, not that summertime is busy it's just that because it's not that's when a lot oh, of people tend to competitive time off yeah, I think Venger. I don't want to be sure. I, want, I think I don't want to 
to put words in his mouth, but I believe he put a video up and said that it was going to be July 22nd, 23rd, 2022. So I'm going to tentatively try to make that. Uh, I do have my family reunion that year near the end of June, beginning of July. So and I'm hosting. So it may be a tough turnaround, but I want to try to get up there if Joe can and maybe represent Biggest Geekus up there at, uh, at Con and see if, you know, we can uh, mingle and meet people and have new friends to play games with. Be yeah cool. i mean if i if i went i would be bringing my wife and sure. uh, we would have to figure out some way to get our dogs taken care of so yeah, that's just, always an issue just put food out like you do cats and let them stay in the house they'll be fine yeah <laughs> oh yeah if only it worked that well yeah that's i mean i love me some dogs but that's not what you want to do with a dog no yeah i mean cats i can be like here's food goodbye <laughs> and they'll be like, all right, I didn't want you here anyway. <laughs> so I mean they might they might greet you at the door when you get home and then say, Oh, it's you. See you later. <laughs> or his dog will be really happy to see mm -hmm. you, but you wouldn't be real happy to see it. <laughs> Not after three days in the house. <laughs> Not after it destroys your house. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Topic for today. Are you ready to move into that? Yes. Okay resource management and rpgs we've hit this a little bit before but i wanted to give it the full episode treatment uh talking about abstraction versus accounting and of course um to me both of those names are a little accounting is definitely a little pejorative um for the action but um had a little article there um singing the praises of, of abstraction but it's basically the idea that you take the idea of managing uh, resources, and this includes hit points, spell points, slots, whatever, powers, dailies, uh, all the way to more mundane things like ammo and you know food and fuel and time, even time passage, and turn it into some abstract mechanic where you just roll for it, rather than the players having to keep track of every piece of food that they have, how many days have passed, how tired are they, and also how many spells do you have. Um, so that idea, yeah, I read that article too. And at the end he was like, well, at first I was thinking of having different classes of points, but I think, but he, he said he wanted to just have one for all of it. Oh, and, wow. and I was like, nah, no, I don't think so. Yeah, that seems too, you can, you can have one die roll. Hey, is uh, Joe's wizard out of spell points? I don't know. Roll a D10. Well, I don't, I didn't, I didn't see where it was a die roll. It was a, uh, no, that's a type. That's a type of. I like, say type. You know, yeah, there's some several mechanics like I've seen uh, where there's actual slots where mm -hmm. you actually have have a slot that oh check off a slot because you cast a spell, which mm -hmm. is what which is kind of how they do mm -hmm. how, how a lot of things can do, um, or a usage die like in the black hack. I mean, every resource has its own usage die, and then I think the first time I think either roll a one if you roll the max or the min on the die type, then it goes down to die type. So if you have a d10 in food. And one day you roll a one, it drops to a D eight. And if you that's want one, that's uh, that's okay. I think that's an okay mechanic. That's a, very, a lot of folks like that system. And then there's the stat one, like in Savage World, you have a wealth stat, and I believe World of Darkness had a wealth stat that you would have, and, and based on your stat, you would have access to this amount of stuff. Yeah, and so. I know, uh, and when I've read about the stat version there were things that could raise or lower the stat over time or events. So um, yes. it can, you could be made poorer or richer. Sure, you can have stat. an event like if you're, a, if you're a wealthy tycoon landowner and then you're hit with some sort of depression. depression. Yeah, and you drop a D, D, a D10 to a D8 or a D6 or something. Yeah, that could be, that would be okay, I guess. But I don't, I don't know if I like, or, or even drop the eight to a seven, a number of value. I'm not as in, on the surface what do you think because the account the other side is the accounting where you have to keep track of every torch every arrow you have seven arrows you fired three in that combat are we going to roll to see if they're broken and if the rule says they're gone when you use them you're down to four arrows that's it um part of me thinks the accounting part works really well in a lower end game but we'll get to that in a minute but well i think some well, accounting is needed huh i think some accounting is needed depending on the system uh yeah. so i think with pathfinder 
yes. and three five D and D, because arrows and arrowing archery is so strong. Mm -hmm. If you don't uh, force the player to account for their arrows, mm -hmm. then they never run out of arrows, and they are in a lot of ways superior to other characters. Yes, because of how strong uh, missile weapons can be. Yes. Uh, if you, I'm not sure fifth edition is uh, the archers are that strong. I don't think so because nothing is really. Um, well, it is relative to the system, but, but I mean, they're, all, they're all pretty good. They're all but, the same level and good mostly. Right. So they're not, um, archery isn't particularly strong. Correct. In fifth I, edition, I, well, I won't say correct. I'm going to say perhaps as well. I've not perhaps. played a long time. I, I don't. I don't really know. But um, certainly in fifth and Pathfinder, it is. And I think in a system, well, what if you had? Um, well, I don't even know if they do rifts, which we're going to talk about, yeah. has uh, mega damage. Yep. Right. So, are you forced to? Um, does the system, does rifts at its base, say you have to keep track of how many mega damage rounds or? energy packs or however those weapons I'm sure are it does. I mean, handled it's been, while, it's been a while since, while since i've played it but yeah i mean i'm sure you keep track of ammo it's not i know you do it's not it's not free right so it's as a glitter awesome. boy if you had a tack nuke or two you wouldn't be able to just say yeah i have tat nukes and oh, they, they don't run out no yeah, you wouldn't be able to do that no now yeah and you're saying like in some systems where you're meant to be more where it's meant to be more either pulpy or more over the top gonzo action, it actually makes more sense not to keep track of ammo and stuff. Yeah, it depends on the tone. It could, yes. it could. Uh, but I think Rifts tries to straddle that line. And I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure. On one hand, Rifts is gonzo, but it's also a very deadly dark place. And deadly it needs to mean, to me, I mean, could be even the mundane stuff. Shoot, I'm out of tactical nuclear missiles on my glitter boy. What am I going to do? You know, because we're fighting the great what they call Splugorth or whatever those big giant dudes that ride around in those circular hovercrafts and they have <laughs> warriors and it's just like that. Yeah. It's crazy, man. It's crazy stuff. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if they are the Splugorths. They might be the minions. The Splugorths might be their masters. So there's something worse. So, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so as far as do you, hmm, on the surface, when I say, okay, Joe, we're gonna play this a game. Mm -hmm. and if, if I don't define, if I don't tell you exactly what the game is yet, but I come out, do you like accounting for all your resources or do you want to do abstraction or do you like something in the middle? Uh, like me, normally it'd be, it'd be a combination. <laughs> I like, I, th I think it's probably better to um, have some abstraction depending on the tone of the game. So if the tone of the game is uh, like misery, uh, porn yeah then of course Game of Thrones. You, yeah then you're definitely going to want to uh grimdark if you've got a grimdark game going on yeah. you have to keep track of everything yeah i think so too because starvation is a feature not a bug i think exactly and like and in some we were talking about overland travel i forgot where i was mentioning this was it on jason's podcast i had mentioned something about uh been lands and how they got a bit of an elaborate overland travel rules and i made the mistake of saying it felt old school and he was like i don't think it's old school at all but what i was saying was the idea of worrying about overland travel feels old school and if you link this to the if you think about the tale of the manicor the way he describes it i mean going out i mean I, I feel nervous for the group when they leave the safe place you're like oh man you're gonna go out it's like and but that's and to me that's kind of cool that's something that's lost when you just go okay we go to greyhawk to to hamlet we go right, from hamlet right. to the free city of or near div this or whatever you know that, that lake and so i'm like whoa and uh we just skip it all and i i guess right now i'm in a place in my mind where i absolutely do not want to skip it all but after you do that for five or six levels and you get to where you can fly and you can teleport, I mean, do you really want everybody to be worrying about how much food they have and when they got water? And I mean, part of me says, yes, you are once again, starving. What do you do? Right. Well, <laughs> part of me says yes, but let the casters take care of it. Cause if you just gloss it over, 
Mm -hmm. then create food and water means nothing. Being able to teleport really means nothing. Because right. nobody worries about, oh, good, Joe's finally got teleport at ninth level. We don't have to worry about travel anymore. Actually, you do if you read the rules. Yeah. Joe doesn't have to worry about travel anymore. Yeah. I'll That's see you when you get there. Yeah, I'll see you in a hamlet. <laughs> I love the end of the welcome lunch. I'm going to go have one of those sweet little hamburgers, and I'll be waiting on you. You know? <laughs> right, right. You do that. Um, that wouldn't engender a lot of goodwill from your companion. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> And so my, my thought is, I think it needs to stay there. I think it, the threat needs to stay there until everyone can overcome it. Mm -hmm. Once the archer has a quiver of Alona, I believe that's the one that lets them in Pathfinder and in three, third edition have unending arrows. Then you don't got to worry about it. Practically you know, unending, then, but yeah. Right, practically. But then, or, is it, or can you store so many in there? You store so many, uh, but you can store so many that it's practically unending. Right, for, I got for 500, typical. 500 arrow for an adventure you're not going to yeah. worry about 500 arrows right right um but i mean i could see a magic item that has i can draw i mean that wouldn't be an overpowered magic item at high level to have the a bow and a, a quiver that lets you draw an arrow out of it right i would say especially in third edition if your character is 12th 13th level and the archer has i got a a back i got a quiver that lets me pull up an endless supply of plus one arrows during combat as, as combat I mean, you can't pull them out and sell them they have to because another one doesn't appear to you use the other one right you have to use it right you can't pull two which might be problematic if you're a double shot if you got all the cool feats lets you do all the sweet stuff but i mean it'd be pretty nice in an osr game sure. for to have an endless pull supply of plus one arrows um i don't think it would be like the break the game at least not my game, it wouldn't break it. Um, so when do you want to make, I mean, that that usage die or stat a stat or like how, I know, how is it? Lamentations of the Flame Princess, they have it for encumbrance. You have each item of a certain size takes up a slot. Some take up half a slot and you have six slots, not counting your armor. So I don't, I, don't, I read it real quickly a couple weeks ago but I haven't looked at it again. Um, I don't, okay. I think that uh, I don't see a huge problem keeping track of everything. Me neither. Um, I understand that people have an issue and they think it's tedious. Yep. Uh, I've used an arrow. I, you mean I have to erase I have to change a number on my sheet? Oh, no. the horror. Oh, oh my horror. gosh. Oh. But I get it. Um, kind of. Uh, kind of. Kind of. I, um, I'm i torn. I do like... I would like there to be... Um, or I like mechanics that are like this. So generally speaking, you don't necessarily do the tedious however right. you can have events that force you into having to do it so let's say you're don't normally keep track of every little apple or piece of bread on your character sheet mm -hmm. however um uh you just all the, the whole group just uh um fell into a swamp and had to drag their their um every, they finally escaped this swamp yes or this effect that rendered all of your food useless. Yeah. So now you have to keep track of stuff until you, yeah. so you have to, perhaps you have to uh, have someone go foraging or hunting and now you have some food to get from A to B, but from that A to B, you do have to keep track. And once you've maybe gone to town and resupplied, then you don't have to worry about it until some other weird event happens like that. That's, that's a good example. I was getting ready to say, I was thinking you were going on this path, like, hey, we're about to do a great overland travel. I need you to keep track of your food. And then players will go buy 47 weeks worth of dry rations just to be safe. But, I mean, we got to think about carrying that, too. So, because uh, I mean, a day's worth of rations is not weightless. No. Yeah, and, and so I'm thinking that's something sometimes we gloss over. And I know, like, in 13th Age, 13th Age is the worst for it. Because, I mean, heck, we don't even spend our gold. When you go right. to a tavern, we don't even talk about it, which I think, I don't know. I just, 
I get it, but it just seems like it's glossing over an abstraction like that that just gloss. I mean, 30 days literally glosses over the need for money. Mm-hmm. And they with their montages travel, while it's interesting story wise, like you know, as us telling a story around the table, it feels really hollow. You know, yes, just, yes. First day you're going to cross the burning sands of, you know, Mahadishu, this cool desert. What happens? You know, and I, and I don't mind using that that element of the group narrative and stuff, but sometimes I think. I feel like overland needs to matter. Right. I think the, uh, when we did in, uh, um, your, your game, the Savage Worlds game Mm -hmm. where the overland travel was treated as a skill challenge. Yeah. So while I, for the, um, podcast, Mm -hmm. Tale of Manicor, where he rolls every day and, yeah, and you know, it's it's uh I, if i was at the table and we had to travel wow. for 10 days and growing every and day I, it would be a little tedious well i remember that even with random encounters remember i would roll behind the time so i just i think it's better to i mean random encounters that. are fine yeah but doing the skill challenge and if one of your skill challenges fails bad enough you have a random encounter or something like that there's still yeah. there's still room for it in that uh setup yeah. So, um, and then some, uh, some part of that, uh, skill challenge for travel, especially if it's long, if it's one or two days mm-hmm. to, uh, an area that, you know, well enough, you may not need to do that. Right. You might check for a random encounter or mm-hmm. some event right. that could be part of the random encounter table, mm-hmm. uh, that gives your characters a challenge. Uh, if you want to, to make it interesting. Yeah. But uh, as far as resource management, I mean, that's kind of part of it because everything interesting has a potential of draining your resources. Correct. And that's so, what I yeah. So, but if you, as this one fellow, the article suggests that your all of your resources are in a pot, um, your hit points, perhaps spell slots, perhaps equipment, everything is handled by the same thing. It's kind of weird yeah. because you could run out of food, but not run out of uh, spells. You could run out of food, but not necessarily otherwise be damaged. So you still have your full hit points Mm -hmm. uh, until you actually are starving. And then I can see you losing hit points. But uh, as far as tracking them, I... I don't have a problem with tracking the typical hit points, spell slots. Oh, sure. And uh, say ammo. Right. Uh, Some other things you can apply events to, uh, food and whatnot, but you can't think that you can make a, if your journey is a whole month long. Yes. You can't carry a month worth of food on your back. Right. Typically, unless you have some magical container. Right. And you would, and if you have, and that's where, ignoring the mule and cart as being too mundane to worry about is really ridiculous. Even at ninth level, if you're traveling in a large car, you know, together, you're going to need people to take care of that. And at high level, you got the money. Wouldn't you bring a cook too? To me, all that stuff can make the, the whole game a little more interesting. Exactly. And, that, and that's something we've, that is something we have lost. I would say since mid to early second edition and it had the same uh, um detracting commentary i have to write about it on my character sheet when <laughs> oh my gosh i gotta track it but i mean it, you know it, it is not fun to keep track of mundane stuff i can see how it could be tedious i mean i can see how you can make that statement but there's no difference that than keeping track of your magical resources no just like them because they're cool and magical Right. I got spells. This is all about the combat. It's so much more important. And maybe it is, but not if you, but that's only because of what you stress, right? Right. If yeah. You, Say, you, thinking that not keeping track of food. I'm not, I don't want to keep track of food. It doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. Food, like keeping you alive. Yeah. Food does a lot for you, even though it's not <laughs> focused on in the game. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think I'm hearing here, you would like, you would like a game 
more the mundane and the magical resources. And when I say magical, I mean like healing spells, even hit, let's call it hit points. They're, they're not, I don't know if they're mundane, they're probably not mundane. Um, spell points and powers, they all take, I mean, they're a part of the game. You have yes. to have to be something we have. I don't want us once we get to ninth level because one person in the party can teleport and two people can fly. And because the spells, that doesn't mean you can fly all the time. Right, right. When you have enough teleports to teleport everybody, we can't just ignore the travel or we can't ignore the food just because you can cast purify food and drink five times a day. day all that means, are you memorizing, are you preparing those, are you burning those slots to right. do that? Right. Okay. And you still have to have food yep. to purify. Yep. You gotta, or create food and water, which I don't you, know. Is, is, is that in the later editions of the game? What, is that create in the food? Yeah. I'm not That's sure where that came from, if that was in the early game or not. That was definitely in the early game. My question create. is, yeah, it was like first or sec, first, second edition. But what about later on? I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's still there or not. But um, so is this, so I guess, I'm not sure if we probably answered it. Is, is this resource management? For some people, it's a fun part of the game, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's like many of the things we talk about. It's uh, play style. It's uh, what you like at the table for yourself. And, you know, some people are like, I don't want I don't care about tracking food. Well, part of the deal, dude. Part of the deal. Uh, and we have or, or find yourself a group where you only play games where um, this stuff is abstracted away and you don't have to worry about it. Or your DM hand waves it. Yeah. Play a game where it's important, but you're, well, it's where it's listed in the rules, but you don't worry about it. Because you can do that with D&D. &D. Yeah. I don't care. We're not going to worry about that. You've got all the stuff you need. Like, remember, even back in the early days, we used to do things like the Adventurer's Pack before they called it that. Mm -hmm. well, you, could, like, why did, did you buy, remember I used to say, did you buy a 50 foot rope? Did you buy a 10 foot pole? Do you have that? You know? Right. right. And, and it's not on your sheet. You don't have it. Right. A little heavy handed, but it's kind of right. Yeah. You really shouldn't. And as a, and that requires, and I mean, I know players will, because players that don't like it will tend to be, do the bad player thing and lie and cheat. Mm -hmm. That's I'm just going to call it what it is. They don't have it, but they say they have it. Or hey, you went to the inn for the night. It cost you a gold for your a gold for your meal and uh, seven silver pieces to spend the night. And then he goes, okay, but nobody marks it down, or not nobody, but several folks don't mark it down. You know, and I've seen that happen, and I'm just like, you know, come on. I, if we're agreed, that's how we're playing. You need to play that way, whether right. you like it or not. Right. Right. You know, so that frustrates me because the resource management, one problem with resource management that I have is it becomes another burden on my shoulders a lot because I, especially after several, I mean, it's nothing, like you say you've played for many months and all of a sudden you guys want to buy something as a group. We're going to buy a potion or we're going to buy this. It's very expensive to get this healing potion. And Jill's like, man, I've only got like two silver left. And they're like, really? Yeah, I do. We've been spending spending money left and right and someone's like well i got 150 gold and you're kind of like you had to pay for stuff too right I mean, and not so won't just be the dm and then at this point i can't call him on it i don't know um i'm getting into the territory of you know people who put bad player habits but um resource management becomes onerous if everybody at the table is not truly committed to it right and i, think I mean uh, i think yeah and i know that we've had talks about this from the early days about mm -hmm. what to keep track of yeah but uh we haven't for a while i don't know that i've ever really i, mean, I know i've thought about it and thought about making it easier somehow and mm -hmm. uh um having an amount of things that you've kept track of and you know you've bought and then uh having some uh, abstracted portion of that so that um, you could at the spur of the moment if the situation deter uh, determines you need a thing you could look at your sheet and say well I don't have it written down but I have this uh, inventory die I can roll and if I roll and high enough or sufficiently enough I actually do have that thing because I know there's systems like that yeah and uh and that can be okay as well yeah, that could yeah so there might be a middle ground 
where right. you're marrying the two things together. Mm -hmm. I do think 13th age's tone and rules as intended would benefit from the black hacks uh, usage die. You I think just, instead of hand waving at all. Yeah, just roll a die. Yeah, do something like that. So if you don't like keeping track of every little crumb, mm -hmm. which I can understand, yeah. uh, instead of just hand waving it all, which makes it uninteresting, mm -hmm. make it interesting by by maybe you do, maybe you don't. Here's a here's a die roll. Um, if you roll poorly enough on your useless die, oh, you don't have any arrows left now, or something like that, mm -hmm. or some event uh, you fall through a well and now you don't have anything except for the clothes on your back. Yeah. So if you're but always... would I have my rope? Well, no, you don't. No. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe you do. Maybe by, but I mean, if if you want to do that, me, I'm I lean right now. I'm leaning a lot more toward uh, having more detailed keeping track of your stuff than less of the dice and the slots and stuff. Right, just, right. Especially since we're, you know, whatever game we start playing, we're not starting at super high level usually. And even if we yeah. are, I don't want to forget that stuff. Even a high level character, life still happens around him. Right, right. But it's, especially at the low end of the game, if you're trying to emulate, not necessarily grim dark, but nope. just just uh, uh, your low level, low power, more nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. If you're emulating that, then you need to ha you need to probably keep track of that stuff. Yeah. Or or your usage dies or your points need are small, small. Yep. and uh, catastrophes are easier to happen at those levels mm -hmm. where you now you're starving or or whatever and once you've built your kingdom and you're the king of the land i mean yeah your usage died d20 right. I, mean, you, um, I have almost whatever i need you know as mm -hmm. long as i'm near in my kingdom i mean i can access lots of stuff mm -hmm. people people just going to give the king stuff I mean, if you're the king of the land or the duke and you're in some small town, you're like, hmm, I need a mule. You could probably find someone to just give it to you on your name alone. Right. right. More than that. They'd say, sure, take it. I'm like, well, I'll pay you back. Oh, that's okay. I mean, and they might be, oh, if, if you get, if you can, that's great. If not, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, because they want to win favor with you. Right. 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 But, so, I mean, that would probably happen more often than not. People be, oh, I need a place to stay. Oh, I'll stay here for free. The king is staying at my inn. Oh, no charge. Although, depending on, circumstances yes that, it, the, uh, the the one in the higher status mm -hmm. might be obligated so if there's depending on how the social structure works yeah feudal uh, system. if if there's an obligation they will have to remunerate yeah and they sure. might even e extra remunerate because yeah yeah sure they have to maintain their status as the the uh, as being uh, in a higher status than you you giving away free stuff to them that means you're better. That could mean you're better than them. Correct. Whereas if if a peasant goes to the the lord's home and says, "Hey, there was an earthquake and it swallowed up my house," the king would say, "Okay, here's a here's a lean to you stay in that, no charge." That would be more appropriate, given relative status, unless everybody always gives stuff to the king, because right. that's just the way things go. Right. It all depends on structure. Sure, you can have all sorts of social rules and right. All that stuff. Um, right now, do do you lean one way or the other? Would you? I mean, it sounds like you're somewhere in the middle. You'd like to have you'd like to have some abstraction in your game. I don't mind keeping track of everything, but mm -hmm. I but having a little abstraction wouldn't hurt. Right. I think a little. I wouldn't go overboard though. No, I, I and I don't definitely don't like it all. I wouldn't like just one big resource die roll it i've seen that in games too this is the resource now mm -hmm. and it fits for every situation i'm like well i guess if you got bigger fish to fry and that's just not going to be part of your game okay um but for me i just i guess i just you're leaving off <sighs> for a game game world to start to feel a little bit real things have to be practical things still have to be things right you know i don't know if i could get i like gaming in a world where no characters have to eat. They ain't got to drink. They don't have to sleep. They go wherever they want. Right. There's and no I, you know, I don't think there's many games that are like that. Right. Truly, it's Truly. more. All of that stuff is hand waved. Hand waved. Sure, you eat. 
sure you sleep, but we don't care about that stuff. Yeah, and you also don't. Where are the bathrooms? Who cares? Yeah, right. Well, you know, you want to worry about that. Yeah. Okay, I gotta go my morning poop. Let me go do this. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you got any other thoughts on this abstraction versus versus more minute? I, I, I will say that after playing so many highly abstracted games like 13th Age, mm -hmm. uh, I could use a bit of accounting. Yes, me too. For grounding, I, for grounding purposes, you know. And I, I even include Pathfinder and third, uh, much of our third edition era in there because we just really worried about the cool new powers our characters had. Yeah, that's true. We didn't, we didn't worry much. Even in 13 days, we don't even worry about spending money at a tavern. And I think sometimes in Pathfinder, we didn't worry about marking off the gold pieces and stuff. So I think a lot of that had to do with Elysium, though. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it did. All right. Nothing else okay. comes wrong for me. We ready to move on? Or? Uh, let's move on. Although my love it, leave it is... Uh sucking the wind because we i thought i had another day and then last night you were like let's do it tomorrow oh you've got nothing for me again well I'm ahead, short, short notice short notice you have you been like planning ahead yeah baby i'm oh. i'm another podcast ahead already and i'll be two or three of ahead by then okay i Gotta guess you are the wiener <laughs> wiener wiener all right let me go first anyway it's my turn and if you can't give me something that's okay how do you feel about miniatures at the table? I like them. You do? I like them. I think that they add to the experience because you it help it can be an aid to visualization. I agree. To either just uh, relative positioning or just to your imagination of what is going on. I think I love them, but not for the. Uh, movement stuff right i just love to come in and see a display a panorama or something even if it's just characters on a battlefield mm -hmm. you know it's just kind of cool um do you ever is there a part of you where it can be can it can it be too much i feel like with us maybe not because third edition didn't really we loved it yeah i think the only way it can get too much is if you're spending more time arraying the the figures on the battlefield than actually mm -hmm. having the battle so it's probably a numbers game so as long as uh the number of figures isn't too great it's not going to slow down uh things too much yeah what about this what about we're going through the repanathook and we're going to push through that great dungeon every room every turn got a draw got a label got to count your squares that we did a little bit of that that got old that can get a little tedious yeah i think i think you should i think there's there's room for theater of the mind even if you have great a bunch of minis too right um board games oh uh, you stole one that i had in my head i like i like board games okay yeah um uh, i would say there are a lesser there are a lesser version of role playing oh yes i agree i agree the only way you can get lower than a board game is play a video game. Yeah, probably. <laughs> for me. For me. <laughs> yeah, so you would say you like them a little? I like them some. Yeah. Classic music. I like it. Do some you? of it I love, yeah. Yeah. Oh, classic music. Yeah, I didn't say classical. Just classic. <laughs> That's too open, huh? <laughs> I think I meant classical. Do you listen to classical too? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. No. I, um, let's see. I'm, I'm going to try to remember the name of one of my favorites, but I'm on the spot here. I don't right. know if I Pressure's can. On. Yeah. <laughs> I don't no listen. To, I don't listen to classical music probably ever. Oh yeah. I have, um, yeah. I don't. I'm not a classical music guy. Like you know Mozart stuff like that. No. Ah. I know folks love it, but I don't get it. So. But Picard loved it. That's true. Picard is pretty awesome, and so I'm, I am. You practical. are, you are remiss. Practically, John Luke himself. I mean, we're practical. We're pro we, should, we should be brothers, actually, the way I look. So, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, nothing for me. Um, no. <laughs> it's twice Joe's punning. I am winning this segment. You are winning. I'm ahead uh, two to nothing. 
so I should plan ahead is what you you're should. saying. Because, just... because I had another day. I was going to consider my know. options you today. Had, I got you. And I put the, well, I knew I had mine done. I thought, well, I bet if I, if I push it to tomorrow, Joe's going to be hosed. And I'll yeah. be winning. So uh, your win in this, uh, in this day has a star next to it. Has an asterisk. An asterisk, yes. <clears throat> Yes, Unless extenuating it's, circumstances. Extenuating circumstances, right. So I'm yeah, because you controlled the game and then you rigged it. That's true. So technically it. I'm 1-0 and oh, and that will not go into the official re record yeah. book. It goes in with an asterisk and it'll be explained in a paragraph at the bottom of the page. All right, cool. All right, let's go. Let's uh, go to a second before we go back to one of our classic ones. We're going to dig a setting. And that setting, as Joe's already mentioned, is riffs. Riffs. All right. So I took a quick wikipedia of riffs and added a couple little things in there so i'm gonna do a quick description of it here well maybe not too quick um <clears throat> it's a multi-genre role-playing game created by kevin symbiota Symbi in august 1990 and published continuously by palladium books since then riffs takes place in a post-apocalyptic future deriving elements from cyberpunk science fiction fantasy horror western mythology and many other genres right it's a hodgepodge of everything kitchen sink Yes, it is. It serves as a crossover environment for a variety of other Palladian games with different universes connected through rifts on Earth that lead to different spa spaces, times, and realities that Palladium calls the Rifts Megaverse. Rifts describes itself as an advanced role-playing game and not an introduction for those new to the concept, which I think is probably fair. It's fair. Um, I've You played the original game, right? Uh, I think so. I'm not but sure I mean, what... There's a Savage Worlds version, which I'm going to mention in a minute. Ah, yes. But also yes. the actual Palladium. Because that's not changed. I mean, that game, those rules have been added on to. So I think that might maybe slightly modified, but the core book is still the core rules since 1990. Um, the core conceit is that dimensional rifts have opened all across Earth, letting through amazing and horrifying creatures from any possible plane of existence. Um, I remember the description. I can't remember it in details, and I should have. And here's why I've not done my homework very well because I pushed it up till today. <laughs> I should have, at the beginning of the Rifts book, they talk about how there was some kind of nuclear war on Earth and somehow of the millions and millions and millions of people dying at that, their death screams opened the first rift to other worlds, which brought in more creatures, which caused more deaths and horror and which were opened up other rifts and it's 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 really evocative i mean it, it's one of those though where like i think rifts you can get overwhelmed with the magnitude of it uh, right uh but i do think it's really when someone describes it i think well that sounds super cool giant robots shooting nuclear tactical nuclear weapons and then you got vampires and you got gods and dragons and cyborgs and all sorts of crazy stuff. Actually, they have a character they call a crazy. Crazies, yeah. Yeah, crazies, and they juicer. Got juicer. Oh yeah, the dudes that take drugs to be kind of like Bane, and I think they were before Bane in the mm -hmm. Batman comics, and they juice up, and all of a sudden they can do superhuman stuff, but their life run. They have a short life, life expectancy, four or five years or something like that, maybe less, two or three years. Um, I haven't heard that the, they continue to publish, as I said about 80 books and i've seen at gen con a couple of years ago kevin symbieta's display and he does have quite a few books for riffs um incremental changes um and they said that palladiums uh changes the game world and they're quick to point out that it's not a second edition that's one of their claim to fame they don't do second edition they have little tweaks to the rules periodically that they put out in a as part of a little piece of a new book um I don't know. Does that feel a little dishonest or is that okay? Would you still say it's not? Well, a if it's just a little revision and it's still compatible. Yeah. Then I, that's fine. Yeah. I think so. Cause it, I, it's not like a, uh, third, fourth edition switcheroo. Yeah. I have the core book, um, the black bound sort of quasi leather one. And I have uh, a couple of rifter, which is like their drag, drag dungeon magazine or dragon magazine books i got at gen con i played a short campaign back in the 90s and i've run maybe one one shot and then when i thought for the longest time when i learned savage worlds i said from the beginning i thought it was a perfect 
fit for a setting to be savage was riffs and they finally did it in 2017 and they updated it again with the adventure edition if you had uh your preferences um which version would you play savage or palladium well um i have played savage and that was fun yeah. i probably would play that because uh you don't need all the setting material is still very valid. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if <clears throat> Savage Rifts covers all the bases on all of the books. Probably no, doesn't. Oh, no, it doesn't. It can't possibly. But um, it's got more than probably, enough. Yeah. It's probably not hard to extrapolate from there if you want to. Yeah. You your own. get all the, all the <clears throat> caster types, the psionics, the, or they call the mind melter. You get all the classic ones, the cyber knight and the glitter boy. You get all the big classes. Um, one thing I found with, as far as rules go, it seemed a little all over the place. Sometimes you're all D20, sometimes you're doing percentiles and PowerPoints and spell points, uh, mega damage, which was a big key there where you have high tech or highly magical items have a type of damage that's beyond normal. So physical bodies and normal equipment in regular everyday earth, a plain sword, a plain, a regular person, a building, they all have what's called SDC, was it mm -hmm. structural damage capacity? Something like that. And then MDC, mega damage. So things that were magical or high tech, and it was like a trade-off of one to 100. So if someone hits you with three mega damage that's 300 structural damage which would blow a real person to pieces um and i recall a cousin of mine when we were playing that campaign in the 90s he was playing what's called a dog boy and that is a mutant dog person and he was in the back of a motorcycle and they were being chased by a uh, samus which is like a personal <laughs> flying machine with rockets on it and he got hit and i said that's when i wrote oh man six mega damage he goes, six damage? He goes, I got 140. I said, no, that's 140 structural damage. I said, that's 600 structural damage equivalent. He's like, what? Yeah, your head's blown off. <laughs> you know, and so, and, and it was like, and I, at first I thought it was really cool way to delineate. A lot of folks hate it. What is the hate of mega damage, do you think? Have you read much about that? People, well, people think about it, but people hate it for some reason. I think that the uh, problem is... <clears throat> If you're running around and you have uh, multiple characters in your group yeah. and two of them have mega damage armor or some way of resisting mega damage and none of the rest do. <laughs> yeah. And some creature rolls in that throws down lots of mega damage. Uh, they're going to wipe the other guys unless they have a way of evading yeah. or something like that. So it's, yeah. it's a very, it's very, um, It's a very uh, huge inequality. Yeah, I think there's, n and I don't know how you balance that other than saying you must pick, I mean, because you can build uh, racial character classes, uh, occupational character classes, like normal classes. I mean, a glitter boy and a bounty hunter rolling together, it's like night and day. Bounty hunter is like an Indiana Jones dude. Yeah, Literally. but I think if if you if you allowed for the possibility for that bounty hunter to find mega damage armor, correct, then good, yeah. uh, because they're highly skilled, yeah, in in all that. But uh, if there was no, if there is no option for a dog boy or a, or a bounty hunter or a few of the other ones, what a, a juicer? I don't think they can resist mega damage naturally. I think they need to have armor of some kind. I'm not really sure. I know they have the crazies. Yeah, in Savage Worlds, they have a template you can put on characters that are like a considered non mega damage characters and give them lots of bonuses and uh, edges and stuff that kind of bring them up to the power level. But you still have the issue of I don't know. I, don't, I can't remember how it worked in Savage Worlds. It seemed like the mega damage was controlled a little better. I don't know how they did it, but it's been a while. Since I mean, mega damage is a function of equipment, unless you're like a dragon or yeah. god laying or something like right. that right so, so what you guys are hearing is this game I mean, there's all sorts of classes and character types you can play and they vary on the power spectrum i mean massively to you know a scholar who's like a regular dude who studies stuff and really has nothing else to a you know godling who is exactly what you sounds like thor right. from the comic 
Thor from the comic books. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Riffs is, I always had a, always had trouble as a DM. I mentioned this to you before off the podcast that when I would sit down and be really excited, oh, I'm going to run a Riffs game or a Riffs campaign. Campaign more than that. I just go, I get, I get stymied by the, I get the analysis paralysis of all the options of everything that could be happening. I mean, the setting itself is on us on our earth and everything has changed. I mean, there's a, the coalition, which is kind of the Nazis of the setting. They're like human only. They're uh, racist against all other, uh, what are they called? DBs, dimensional beings, creatures that have come through the rifts. And uh, they live in the Chicago area. Chi Town is called Chi Town now. And it's more than just Chicago. It's an area region. The coalition is big on technology to fight all the DBs and they want to help humanity, but I mean, they want to help them and they want to exclude everybody else and they want to control things and they're not really nice people. And there's no, a no, no. confederation of magic, which is all about magical stuff. And then there's different, you know, different places in the world out West is run by vampire Lords and stuff. So it's, it's, it's pretty wild, but cool. And you can travel between worlds I think it would, I think in Savage Worlds, it works really well, but as a, because you could like, they talk about how you could bring a gunslinger from Deadlands into Rifts and just give him one of those, it's called M-Mars, M-A-R-S is acronym, template to put on top of him so that he fits the the Rifts world, you know? Ah. Uh, he's not a complete douche nozzle. Um, I don't know how you, I mean, can't, how story-wise you would describe that, but I know as a DM sometimes, I just get, and I think it's because I just don't pick a small little corner of the world to do something in, which would be the solution. Probably. Yeah. Especially until uh, while you don't have a great handle on the enormity, you yes. can pick a small spot and use the stuff you know, and then read up on the other stuff or just ignore it. Yeah. Because True. you don't need to have, uh, like a lot of these things, you don't need to have a world spanning campaign right that interacts with the majority of things that are there to have fun right. you p you uh pick your small area and you do your stuff there and then you use as much as you're comfortable with and not speaking of our giveaway we do have to get busy because i did kickstart the atlantis version of riffs that they just did ah. <laughs> i'm doing really good not not buying stuff so <laughs> Joe is shaking his head if you are listening to us on the yes, podcast. Yes. And rightly so. Randy should be ashamed of himself. Um, yes. But no, it's a kickstart from Shane Hensley, so you know I'm getting my stuff. It's not whether I'm getting my stuff. True, true. Kickstarting yeah. folks of high repute. Yeah, but... Whether you like their stuff or not, um, yeah. Shane Hensley and uh, he Pentacle. delivers. He delivers. Yeah, he delivers. You're getting it, and you're getting a lot of stuff, and you're getting your money's worth. As far as I know, there might be folks out there who know that he's not delivered something, but that would be uh, a surprise. Not me. I've got mine in full and pretty much right when he says it. So, right. um, but back to riffs. So with this sort of set in this kitchen sink, what, oh, and do you, do you recall how they, how you would pick, do you get points to build your character? Or you just did and, and riffs or did you just pick, I think you just picked the character, right? Yeah, but there's some point build aspect too. I can't remember. Yes. Hold on a second. They have they have stats and stuff and um like um gosh, I'm trying to remember. I have a riffs book. Me too. And Joe and I are both leaving the microphone to make this very difficult for you to hear. At least for me. Distancing myself. I found my core one. This is the uh, collector one I was telling you about. Oh, yeah. And yeah, they have, and you have stats that are not unlike D&D, uh, &D, um, but you also have a bunch of others. The skill list is pretty massive. I mean, I'm showing folks on YouTube land. That's the first page of the skill, skill list. And then here's the second page of the skill list. And I'm just trying to think when you run into beasties and characters, they're statistic. I thought the, char the character sheet was just often ginormous. 
uh, attributes, IQ, physical endurance, physical strength, mental endurance. Yeah, and then a billion skills. Yeah. Yeah, I have a version. Here's mine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had that one time. Yep. That's the so, same as this, just a different, different cover. cover. Yeah. Yeah. Riffs was, uh, I don't know, when I, that was, I think that might have been after we had our little exploration of Traveler, Warhammer, and Marvel Superheroes, we went back to D&D for a long time. And then in the 90s, I think you were already off to the military. We saw, I saw this somewhere on the shelf, saw the one Joe has, the paperback version, and I had to get it. I just thought it, when I flipped through it, I was just like, ooh, and ah, and over the pictures, and it sounded really cool. Yeah, I have the ninth printing. I'm not sure what yours is. Yeah, this is something I got. I want to say I, I got this at Gen Con for about 20 bucks at the auction. Oh, it, oh, okay. That wasn't yeah. a that wasn't a Kickstarter. No, it started at a special it, edition. It started thing. at a dollar. That was oh. the auction. I was like, what? And um, yeah, this is the 95 copy, year 1995. So though so it says copyright for oh palladium books, copyright. Yeah. Right. Special. Oh, anyway. This but is anyway. 95 as well. It probably, I guess it is the same. Yeah, probably this is 95 as well. Just it's called the RPG, the uh, Riffs RPG Collector's Edition. But um when I think about the, how the world is, I mean, the world's evocative and cool, and they talk about the problems with the coalition and the magical federation and what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Australia, and there's Atlantis as a, as a faction down, down below the water, and then there's creatures that come in. I think there's like, I think space travel is very limited in the Rifts world, though. I think there's some kind of thing that stops space travel, meaning oh. on, our, on our Earth, you have to go to a Rift to be able to do stuff. I think so. But... Um, how did you like your experiences playing riffs? Generally oh, it was speaking? always fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, how do you rank it on our scale here of extra small to two X? Would you, could you rank this bed? Uh, probably large. Yeah. I would say large too, even though with some of the rules driving me a little crazy. I mean, it's a, I think the rules are kind of all over the place. If you use the actual riffs game, if you use savage worlds, the large, the large might become extra large because I think it has a lot of potential, but I just haven't played it enough. Um, I'm willing to do a full blown campaign, but I have to really focus myself. I just, I think I just, and this is rare for me, but I get a little ADD when I look at riffs. I don't know why I do. I just do. You want to use it all. And that's probably it. Yeah. That's probably it. All right. Cool. Yeah, I think it, um, it's probably, I probably would like it more if I played it more. Yeah, I think and I would I think, play it more if I liked it more. <laughs> One or the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Anything else, Bud? Or you? Oh, we don't have a negative plane today, do we? We do not. Okay, so we're going to keep this on the show. It's only been one day. Nothing, nothing uh, negative has happened. Yes, nothing negative can happen in one day. Come on, we know that. Well, if you'd like to support our show, please help get the word out. Check out our website. Uh, www.biggestgeekestpodcast.com and if you want to support us great hit the support tab we'd really like you just to share with your friends let them know how we roll and that you totally love us check us out on odyssey and youtube and uh, rate us on apple itunes or if your podcatcher you listen to lets you rate us rate us there our email is the geeks at biggestgeekestpodcast.com uh, feel free to send any comments or questions on there Somebody I know said he's sending us an email. I guess he hasn't done it yet. He but. has not. And uh, we'd like you to check out the podcast that we have linked below. We got several that we really do like. So you probably will like them too. All right. Well, this is Randy. And this is Joe. And remember, you can't be big like us, then be geeks like us. <laughs>